The Foundation regularly deals with anomalies of a more sinister nature. The most frightening among these, of course, are the ones that stalk and kill Foundation operatives. For no clear rhyme or reason, sometimes the Foundation's agents and researchers become subject to things that seek to entrap and utterly consume them. Dr. Elizabeth Graham is one such poor soul. Nowadays, her name is whispered through mess halls and cubicles, since no one really seems to know what happened to her. One moment she was carrying a stack of files between two offices, the next completely gone. The Foundation's security teams couldn't figure out what happened to her. The CCTV cameras just showed her blinking out of existence and the files falling to the floor. Her biometric scanners simply returned a dead signal. It seemed that one day, Dr. Graham simply ceased to exist. Of course, the Foundation isn't above keeping secrets from its own personnel. Perhaps they did find something. A series of SCP documents, covered in sand, suddenly appearing in Graham's office one day, neatly stacked and paperclipped, all signed by her in her own handwriting, and detailing her days spent in a pocket reality of some sort. It wouldn't be the first time it had happened. The infamous Red Reality incident with Dr. Robert Scranton had already upset researchers, and there was no reason to alarm them further about something they couldn't change. So Dr. Graham's papers were covered up and relegated to long-term storage, where they would likely never be thought of again. But don't you wonder, what happened to Dr. Graham? The first thing Dr. Graham felt when she woke up was confusion. She didn't remember falling asleep. In fact, she didn't remember much at all. She had been moving files between two offices at Site-22 on a normal workday. She said hello to some of her coworkers and had a late lunch before returning to work. And then, nothing. The second thing she felt was fear. She looked around and realized she was in some kind of desert. A bright blue sky was overhead, and there seemed to be a sun. But all around her was sand. Massive sand dunes, flowing sand plains, and even what looked like a sandstorm in the distance. But all there was, was sand. Dr. Graham then noticed she was still holding some things. A small folder, filled with paperclip documents. Pulling one out, she realized what it was a template document for an SCP file, complete with sections for object class, containment procedures, and descriptions. This place was obviously not normal, but she had been anomalously transported to it. It needed to be documented. There was nothing else to do, so she sat down and began to write. She guessed at a number. Who knows what SCP the Foundation was on now? Might as well pick something for the middle. She scrawled SCP-3890 at the top, and bubbled in Keter for the object class. The containment procedures were spartan, but effective. No effective measures of containment were possible, and she would focus on simply exploring and finding out what was going on. Then came the description. No point in sticking to the Foundation's signature clinical tone, given the circumstances. It was more important to get the information down, and so she began to transcribe her thoughts. SCP-3890 is a potentially extra-dimensional or extraterrestrial space which I, Dr. Elizabeth Graham, was somehow transported to from Site-22 on 2-17-16. I am uncertain as to whether I was transported here due to my involvement with the Foundation. After finishing the paragraph, she picked herself up off the sand dune she had landed on and started to walk in the direction of the sun. She didn't have much information and exploring would be necessary if she was to accurately document the anomaly. It didn't take long before she came across something in the distance. An old, collapsed temple, completely ruined from the outside, the structure sagging in on itself. It had the columns and facades of a Roman building, she noticed. Peering inside, it was completely empty, except for more sand. In the distance, more ruins were present some older, and some more modern office-looking buildings. In terms of geography, SCP-3890 takes the form of a seemingly infinite desert plain, with ruins of differing architectural design poking out through the sand. I have noted the presence of buildings of modern design, along with what appear to be ruins of ancient Roman and Eryxian structures. She only noticed the first figure when the sun started to set. As the sky shifted to twilight, she saw a person walking, casting a long shadow. Excitedly, she yelled out to no response. When she approached, she saw a man in an older suit with completely lifeless eyes stumbling along. 
SCP-3890-1 is my collective designation for the humanoid entities that wander through SCP-3890. They do not respond to any stimuli, and as far as I've been able to tell, simply walk around without a specific destination. SCP-3890-1 are either entities that have been created to resemble humans but imperfect, or they are humans who have been mentally altered in some way to rob them of their faculties. There did seem to be some kind of a day-night cycle, and she didn't feel hungry or thirsty at all, though she did feel sleepy. After her first day in the desert, Dr. Graham settled in one of the collapsed ruins, drifting off to sleep. The second document opens much differently. This appears to be a document for something designated SCP-3890-2 Keter. The containment procedures are simply to always, constantly, be on guard for it, whatever it is. If Dr. Graham feels something she is approaching is not as it appears, she is to immediately retreat. The description is a little clearer. SCP-3890-2 is a living entity of varying shape and size, which resides in SCP-3890. I am uncertain as to whether SCP-3890-2 originates here, or if it was transported here at some point in the same way I was. From what I have observed of its behavior, it appears to be some form of predator. SCP-3890-2 is currently hunting me. I first encountered the entity shortly after writing down my initial observations of SCP-3890. It snuck up behind me while I was resting, and got me while I wasn't paying attention. I was knocked unconscious by its attack, and woke up several hours later during the night. It had attacked me several times since that first encounter, with several hours between each attack. She was caught off guard by it last night. She hadn't noticed its presence. It seemed to just be another building in the far-off horizon, when she sat down and pulled out her pencil and paper again. She had started to fill in some more information about the humanoids. They seemed to continuously walk in circles around some of the ruins, though it was unclear to her why, or even whether they were aware of what they were doing. But when she pulled her pencil out, she heard the buzzing in her head. It was like TV static, initially soft and low, but then ramping up and quickly becoming deafening, stifling her ability to think. She looked up, and she saw it. For a moment, it retained its form as the building in the horizon, but that quickly changed. It began to unfold on itself, completely black on the inside, like a dark paper crane continually folding and unfolding, stretching and compressing in on itself. By the time Dr. Graham got to her feet and ran away, she began to realize what it had done and quickly scrawled it onto the paper. SCP-3890-2 uses amnestization as a form of attack. While it has not injured me physically thus far, I have lost all memory of significant chunks of my childhood and early adulthood. I can no longer recall which high school I went to or what my first job was. My current hypothesis is that, as an entity, it feeds upon memory. At first, Dr. Graham avoided buildings and stayed to the empty parts of the desert while walking. But when the creature appeared again, unfolding out of what seemed to be a piece of paper, it became clear what it was. A mimic. In the coming hours, it would pretend to be a star, a human, a fly, even a patch of dirt, while trying to make Graham come closer enough to consume her mind. The next document opens in even more dire circumstances. The containment procedures have shifted drastically. Containment now focuses on making sure that the mimic does not consume any memories that Dr. Graham cannot afford to lose. She is to write down all vital memories so she can recall them if they do get destroyed, and watch for its presence in situations and at all times. She writes the document while huddled in a vault in a bank dropped into SCP-3890, since it offers a little security from the creature, but the corpses of a family in the bank imply something less hopeful. They chose to die by their own hand, rather than let the Mimic get to them. Graham plans to kill anything that tries to enter the vault to ensure that the Mimic doesn't get in, but has bigger problems. I have lost all memories regarding how I came to be employed by the Foundation. I know that I am a Foundation researcher with level 3 clearance, but I simply cannot recall how I came to be in this position. Many of the SCP objects I worked with are also missing from my memory. I can tell there is a hole there, but I just don't know what was there before. Her memories of her own identity have been obliterated. Who she is, where she's from, what the Foundation even is, they have all been taken by the Mimic. Without fail, it manages to surprise her and consume an important memory, 
and dashing away as she tries to figure out what got stolen from her. Something small, like her favorite food or her childhood bedroom, or something foundational and fundamental, like her name and her sense of self. And avoiding it isn't an option. It can pretend to be any of the single grains of sand in the boundless desert. And Graham came to the conclusion, this is an infinite dimension of sand, serving as a hunting grounds for the mimic. Of course, it could be anything else too. A brick, a window, any of the buildings, any of the mindless wandering people, or the clothes on Dr. Graham's back. Any of them could be the mimic, and Graham thought of that too. It's why she hasn't let go of her knife in days. Even though it's dripping blood from examining the corpses of the former victims of SCP-3890-2. Even though she doesn't need to eat or drink, there is another concern. Sleep. The moment she falls asleep, the mimic will no doubt be upon her. She hastily scribbled down a little bit more onto the paper before trying to rest. The sun's going down. I can't allow myself to fall asleep. 3890-2 will come in without a doubt if I do. I don't have to eat, I don't have to drink, but I still have to sleep. This place is designed for the mimic's benefit. It can hunt its prey to its heart's content without them dying of thirst and starvation. Is this an enclosure, maybe? Some kind of sick game? My name is Elizabeth Graham. I can't forget that now. This page is my memory. The next word she writes on that paper shows something ominous. She can hear crying outside of her makeshift shelter. The next document, things have changed. Someone named Tony is mentioned in the containment procedures. Someone Graham trusts to take watch while she sleeps and watches for the mimic. The descriptions explain, Tony is a child, only 10 years old, who fell into this dimension, the same as Graham, when walking home from the playground. The mimic can imitate objects, but it can't speak. The boy is real. They've worked on a rudimentary password system to confirm each other's identities regardless. Graham feels almost hopeful. Their chances of survival have doubled, even though they're being hunted, not for their lives, but for the precious memories inside their heads. But she's still worried about other things. If people don't starve or thirst to death in SCP-3890, do they age? How long have the mindless humanoids been wandering around? How long has she been wandering around? Though she reminds herself of her training, she also faces the fact that she might have been exclusively picked for a past reason. I have this memory from my childhood still. Everything around it is gone, but it's sort of floating free, devoid of context. I'm visiting a woman in a hospital. I, I think it's a hospital, and I think it's a woman I know. A close relative? My mother or my grandmother, I think. And I go to visit her. I'm just a kid, 12, I think. And she doesn't know who I am at all. I don't remember what happened before that or after. Perhaps the mimic brought her here because it knew she would hate having her mind consumed like this. But that would mean it wasn't just intelligent, that it was sadistic and cruel. She noted down she'd asked Tony if he had a similar experience, and they'd be a little closer to working it out. The document is hopeful. Dr. Graham now has something to believe in. The next document is a complete mess. Scribblings and scrawlings in the margins, and the text doesn't even begin to make any kind of sense. It's all word salad, the ravings of someone gone utterly insane. She mentions herself, her own name repeatedly and constantly, but in between are mentions of Tony, the Foundation, the Mimic, and everything in between. Dr. Graham has lost her grip on reality. That or whatever wrote this wasn't Dr. Elizabeth Graham. The document after that has a very simple containment procedures. She is to kill SCP-3890-2, the Mimic. Description. I woke up this morning. Tony was gone. He was the Mimic. It was smarter than I thought, I guess. I was stupid. I should have seen this coming, but I was desperate and it knew it. All it left was some scrawled document and a hole in my head the shape of my name. The Mimic, disguising itself as a child, had stolen the last thing she had left. Her name. All of Graham's precautions were useless. Even though her name was written down a dozen times in the last documentation, she cannot remember it. In fact, when she reads it, it immediately removes itself from her mind again. Not only has it taken her memory, it has taken her ability to reform them. And the document it left behind is one of her own. 
an SCP template, though of course she doesn't know what the Foundation is anymore. The same document we have seen previously in the pile, yes. The Mimic is learning to imitate Graham and getting better at it. Maybe that's why she hasn't been killed yet. It's yet to pin down her thought process and is waiting until it has her perfectly memorized. Not that she would know, given that she's forgotten how she even came here, or when. But the Mimic made a mistake. It took everything from her, even her hope, which has left Dr. Elizabeth Graham a woman with nothing left to lose. She resolves. She will not get out of SCP-3890. The documents will probably wind back up in Foundation possession from some testing with an unrelated anomaly, but she will be a mindless husk, or worse. She plans to kill the Mimic. It's a cowardly, fearful stalker creature, and only hunts by pretending to be other things. She knows she can take it in a fight, and she still has her knife. The next document is Sober, the object class, Neutralized. Dr. Graham walked boundlessly through the desert until the Mimic jumped for her. It unfolded from a cloud, turning into a mass of black origami and lunging for her. It didn't expect her to turn around and slash outward with her knife, piercing its strange black flesh. It let out a scream, shrank, and Dr. Graham realized that it could feel pain. So when it lunged again, she drove her knife deeper into it before pulling back. And she repeated the process until it was a tiny black mite in the sand, and then she crushed it under her heel. It was that easy, that simple. But of course, every time it had come close to her, it had taken another bite out of her mind, just as she took another slash at its form. We opened each other up. I filled its body with holes, and it filled my mind with them. There's not much left of me. She curses herself from not having done it earlier, but maybe there was a reason. She can't remember it anymore. In any case, the Mimic's dying bites from her were particularly damaging. The straw that broke the camel's back. What's left of Dr. Elizabeth Graham is falling apart. She scribbles things down onto the paper, while her mind realizes that she can't even understand what she's writing anymore. The next document is empty. Not every story with the Foundation's agents fighting a monster has a happy ending. Now go check out SCP-3001 Red Reality and SCP-3838 Nomads of the Fourth Dimensional Step for more otherworldly dimension-related SCPs.